Uh, and last night, when NC-10 picked up at the airport and we drove through uh, Seville Square and into Ferdinand Square and looked around, I was absolutely blown away. I had no idea uh, that this existed here. Um, and I say that as an opening of this talk because my talk is going to be largely a celebration in other cities of many of the same qualities that you have here. A sense of history, a sense of place, a sense of location. I believe that these elements are important economic assets for a city. Important economic assets. They're certainly important for the quality of life, but they're important from the standpoint of economic development. Now it's fascinating, you could sum up the history of cities, particularly downtown of cities, uh, in two sentences, maybe three. One is, for three or four thousand years, downtowns and the centers of cities were perceived to be absolutely the best parts of reason, repositories of culture, the most refined civilized behavior, the best of everything. First sentence. Second sentence, for a brief period, roughly 45 years, beginning in 1945, suddenly downtowns plummeted in their perceived importance in regions and became second rate, became perceived to be not the best places, in some cases, to be the worst places. And now, third sentence, at the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, we're in what appears to be a major renaissance, a return to the center city's tradition and traditional role as being the points of greatest excellence in their regions. A lot of talk has been given about the suburban expansion and the impact of that, difficulty in competing, all of which I believe to have been important factors, but to a certain extent, we're a little bit beside the point of what's happening now. I believe that center cities, downtowns in particular, are now emerging in a new role in their region. They're no longer central business districts. They're no longer tied to traditional industries. They are becoming, in a sense, the city and the region's neighborhood, in which places to live, places to work, places of culture, places of recreation, places of entertainment, particular kinds of shopping, restaurants, are all part of a total environment, a living, walking environment, in which you come in contact with many, many other people. They are returning to their fundamental role as being places which are urbane, places that are abandoned, places in which many different people function together and interact comfortably no matter how different they are from each other. And I would argue that these kinds of places are not only essential for the survival of cities, they are actually essential for the survival of civilization and culture. Because it is in the coming together in chance encounters that great advances are being made. So therefore, it is my belief, and we see it, we're now typically in our firm we work at any given time in something like 35 or 40 different cities in 20 states, including two projects overseas. And we find in every place, in every region, we find this quality of urbanity, of bringing back life to the center city, as being the most important agenda, both on people's minds, on government, We also are now in a phase in which economic development means something different than it did 20 or 30 years ago. With the advent of the new economy, I think it's still there. I think it's still there. Um, and with the importance and the, ch the change of our whole economy in which most people are becoming knowledge workers. All the cities we work in, the word knowledge worker comes up as a prime factor in economic development. We're dealing with a group of people and a nature of business in which you are no longer tied to a geographic place by virtue of your job. You have choice as to where you live. And therefore, the quality of life, the quality of place, the quality of vanity 
becomes extremely important in where you make your decisions to where you're going to go. Therefore, it becomes a major factor in economic development in attractive business places. Now, a lot has been said about livability. You've got to have livable cities, which I agree with. Absolutely true. However, I come to believe that there's an even more important quality, which at the risk of sounding mawkish and sentimental, um, I would characterize as being lovable. Not just livable, but lovable. Lovability as a quality of cities. What is it about some cities that the first time visitor falls in love with? What quality causes us to fall in love with? What qualities are, are there in a place as that is lifelong residents who apply passionately to their accent? I live in Pittsburgh. We have 300,000 people, and we have a major league baseball team and a major league football team. We probably don't deserve a major league baseball team. But they're doing better this year, so they deserve neither, but uh, by virtue of our size. And yet, you'll never get those teams away. There's a passion within the city to keep those things, those elements. And as you look at hard times and good times in the city, those places which have citizens in love with their city, with this sense of community, are the ones that are best able to ride the crest and waves of the economic change. So I have asked myself many times what contributes to the world. Obviously, lots of personal things. Do we have time there? Do we have team there? Are we happy there? But my question is really about the physical design of this. What can we, as architects and designers, do to make places more lovable? And I think there are just two problems. The first is a connection with the region, a connection with the natural landscape that defines the region. So if it's a city in the mountains, it should be a mountain city. Pittsburgh is such a place. You feel like you're in the mountains. Right? You look out to view the mountains. Think about Barron in Switzerland. Or Como in Italy. You look into the mountains. They're part of every experience there. I've told this about water cities. We've been fortunate to work in many cities on waterfronts of various sorts in our practice. And I think calling them water cities is a useful way of testing how effective the cities embrace, encapsulate this miracle of nature that they're adjacent to, the water, and all the special properties of And how much does that sense of water permeate the spaces and places of the city? The second quality has to do with an architectural character. If you are somewhere and you know where you are as you round the street corner and look at buildings, and you know that you're in Mexico, or that you know you're in San Diego, or that you know you're in Pittsburgh, I believe it's because there is a consistency to the architectural vocabulary in which there is a sense of how the architecture of one generation relates to the next generation to the other, in which there's a tie to the tradition of that place. Those two qualities I believe to be extremely important, and I'd like to try to prove that in the following way. The first is to share with you some observations on some of the cities that are the, the top, top couple cities in everybody's hit list, the great cities, local cities. St. Petersburg, Venice, Paris, Towns on the Riviera, how could we live to in that list? And try to draw some lessons from them. Secondly, I'd like to share with you some experiences of American cities in transition, particularly focused on waterfronts, and how our attitude of use and use of waterfronts uh, is changing and has been changing over the course of the last 30 years. And finally, I'd like to share with you some of some thoughts on our now 15 years worth of work in Norfolk, Virginia, in which we have really led the urban design and design aspect of the revitalization of that city from one of the most dead cities on the East Coast to what is now in the last two or three years becomes a very vital place and incidentally a water city. So we begin with the first image. We've been talking about that image. There's some magic that has to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm of a generation in which all of this is very mysterious, but it's great, isn't it? <laughs> when it works. All right, now the first
first city we're going to look at is uh, St. Petersburg. Um, and St. Petersburg, I find absolutely fascinating um, because of any city you can think of, or that I can think of, it's been through more trouble and travails in the last hundred years than any other. Just think about the siege of Leningrad in World War II and all these heroic stories you hear about how people survived. It's interesting that Stalin tried very hard to change the physical character of St. Petersburg. And unlike every other place he tried, he failed. He was not able, with all of all of his power, to destroy the architectural heritage and character of St. Petersburg. People at St. Petersburg called their city by its first name, Peter. Think about what that means in terms of one's relationship to one's city. You brush up against the building, you just had to brush up against people. As if it were a person, a living place. And I would argue that this quality is largely, largely contributes to the resilience of this place. There's no question that it's a city on the water. Uh, Peter the Great, it's not a very old city, it's only two, three hundred years old. Uh, Peter the Great, when he founded it, lived on this island, built this cathedral. So that the cathedral, instead of being in the middle of a dense cluster of streets, is actually on island, in the middle of a port, the middle of St. Peter's and Paul. Uh, nearby is a peninsula on which you have these great rostrums, which are uh, tributes to naval victories, the naval city where the Russian Navy was headquartered. And so you have this sort of funny take on Roman traditions with vessels of ships sort of plowed into this monumental column, celebrating it. And across the way, we see the great palace of the Hermitage, which is a building like the Admiralty, which is the building you see over just barely over on the far right, which is directly on the banks of the Nehru, a river which is rather fierce in many ways, in terms of its speed of its tide um, and some of the flooding that happens along it. But great effort was made to create a facade directly on the river so that the river is embraced, the waterfront is embraced by the buildings, and a beautiful space is made uh, within it. If you were to look back into one of those arches that you saw, you might come to this one, which is the Winter Canal, uh, in which from the Neva, a canal goes back and you walk along it, uh, enchanted, I might say, by the quality of the architecture. Uh, this is part of the palace complex, but now it's actually the lobby of the theater. So you can walk along underneath the structure, out to the river, always focusing on the water, or during an admission, you'll be up in that space, looking one direction to the canal, another direction to the Great River, and across to the cathedral of St. Peter and Paul. And so we have poets writing things. Joseph Brodsky, Nobel Prize winning poet, says this about St. Petersburg. The 12 mile long neighbor is the we saw, branching right in the center of the town with its 25 large and small, uh, and large and small coiling canals provides the city with such a quantity of mirrors that narcissism becomes inevitable. Reflected every second by thousands of square feet of running silver amalgam, it's as if the city were constantly being filled by its river, which discharges its footage into the Gulf of Finland, which on a sunny day looks like a depository of these blinding images, the inexhaustible, maddening multiplication of all these pilasters, colonnades, porticos, hints at the possibility that at least in the inanimate world, Water may be regarded as a condensed form of time. So one great person's response to physical environment has produced, in my mind, one of the most beautiful pieces of prose ever written. And it's tribute to the power of how the natural environment and the built environment fit together. A little bit away from the water, there are great buildings which follow this architecture of a You know you're in St. Petersburg. It's built at a different time than the buildings we were just looking at has the same kind of architectural scale and architectural elements. Further away, a little bit inland, uh, away from the river, still the irresistible urge to proclaim the water city quality of St. Petersburg creates a whole series of pools and mountains and artificial 
artificial lace that bring Brodsky's words to life about the reflection of architecture in it. And penetrating through the city are all of these canals. And it's interesting, even in its dilapidated state today in this city, the most carefully tended elements in the city are the bridges and the embankments and the railings that create the public space. So without point to eat or to improve the buildings, it's the public ground which is tended and cared with such love. Now it's interesting to look at maps that you find in guidebooks, which make this very clear. You can see this view is looking across the Neva to the fortress with the Cathedral of St. Peter of Paul. You can see the Hermitage, which we saw, the uh, Winter Canal, which you can see tucked right in here. You can see this great space that we were just in, and you can see the second canal. So that you can see the built environment in which people live and work comes right up to and embraces the water so it's everywhere where they are. Uh, this other island that's part of St. Petersburg runs from the, uh, includes the neighbor river, goes all the way to the Gulf of Finland, so that you can see the relationship of these parts. And here are these rather cokey rostrum things that we saw at the beginning celebrating the Tsar's naval victory. Um, and my favorite thing is the cover of one of the recent guidebooks for St. Petersburg, in which, naturally, on the cover, you want to summarize the most important, what is the most important quality about your city? Well, look at this view. It's got the cathedral. It's got the aircraft. It's got this great building with the garden. It's got the admiralty. It's got the cathedral and the bubble. It's got the water and the relationship between these elements and the water. Another great water city. Uh, this Chamber of Commerce poster from 1695 shows the city of Venice in its lagoon. Some would argue that blue is not exactly the right color for the water, but nevertheless, uh, it makes the point that this is a kind of jewel set in a velvet kind of lagoon. Uh, we see the form of the city. We see Piazza San, uh, di San Marco right there. We see the Grand Canal. We see the incredible tangle of streets. We see the little tangle of canals permeating through it, all in this view. And we see the main entrance to the city as it comes up the air. So this city with its great spaces is clearly the most obvious of the water cities that we could look at. It's interesting, at the end of the 19th century, there was a visionary architect, not from Venice, from Trieste, who proposed a dramatic change to Venice, to the city council. He said, enough of this water already, let's pave the canals and turn them into streets. Well, it's a fortunate thing that the citizenry rose up and uh, defeated that proposal very, very quickly because, of course, the essential quality of the city would be lost in spite of great pressure of the Bavarian people trying to catch up to the modern world. I think we can all think of examples in our own time in which that happened. Just take the province of Rhode Island, which in the 1950s had paved over all the rivers, and only recently have they ripped out all those rivers and unearthed them and created a wonderful kind of water city. But Venice has more things to tell us than just about its relationship to the water, although in looking at its relationship to the water, you can learn some things about how to do things, how things get done. One of painting by Canaletto in the Piazza San Marco, uh, looking out towards the water and the lagoon with Gladio San Giorgio Maggiore across the water in the great basilica of the tower. Uh, the procurator's residences and the land part of the piazza as well as the water part of the piazza. Well, let's look at this a little bit more. I'm fascinated when we, I'm sorry, I'm fascinated when we look at it um, and stand down on the ground and look out from that point just next to the great Campanile, which is here, just in front of the facility, you can see the corner, that we are looking at Palladio's facade. San Giorgio on this island. It is an integral part of the space in which we are located. We're standing in a room, and this is one of the elements in that room, framed by the two columns of the patron saints of Venice. However, it's half a mile away, across the water, so that we're in the space. The space is formed in such a way that it bridges across the water, brings the water into our very experience. And so this room that we're in includes the water as part of the experience and connects it to the land part of the piazza so that wherever we are in the sequence
types of spaces, we sense our relationship to the waterfront and to the landscape around it. Um, now, one of the aspects about this which I find fascinating is that there are many, many routes into the Piazza, which we now take. When, before the trains came, the main entrance to Venice was from the water. That was the front door. That was the way in which important visitors would arrive. That's what you wanted, where you want to put your best face forward, where your tuxedo should show to its best. And so I find another Chamber of Commerce post written in the 18th century extremely useful. It's a kind of later painting of an important event on the Grand Canal. What an entrance into the city. Imagine yourself having come across the lagoon, slowly approaching this, and then arriving at this splendid assembly of buildings of different periods, sort of Byzantine Romanesque, sort of Gothic period, uh, Mannerist, Renaissance, sort of combination of all those things here and here. Buildings from different periods of time, talking to each other the same language, recognizable as Venetian, even though they're from different periods of time. This is the image we have of Venice. It was part of how they marketed themselves, how they did their, their conducted their business, and became such an important political and economic power in, in, in their in their peak time. It didn't always look like this. It got built over time. And one of the most fascinating stories, I think, is the construction of the library, which is the building not yet here, but to be built on the site opposite the Doge's Cross. And don't pay attention to the type of water or anything like that. That's not what we're, <laughs> that's not what we're this about. Uh, interesting story here. Uh, Jacopo Sansovino was the architect for a group called the Procurators of St. Mark's. And this was a group of people who, within the government, had the responsibility for maintaining the piazza and the buildings around it. They paid for the maintenance of the piazza by the revenues of the commercial businesses that were around it. So the success of those commercial businesses was extremely important to paying the bills. Not only that, they built themselves elegant houses on the piazza. They had to have the revenues help pay for those houses. So they were very anxious that there be commercial uses. Now, the idea to build a library came when after having a, a collection of ancient uh, writings for 200 years, the citizens of Venice got embarrassed and felt they needed a library to house it. Now notice this rabble tag old group of buildings. Keeping in mind that this was the main entrance to the city. These were a series of shanty-like commercial uses and an extremely disreputable hotel right here at the entrance with short-term rentals, with very famous for its permanent residents, one of whom you can see in the room. So imagine the scandal. Here we have the greatest city of the world, this great formal entrance, and the biggest revenue producer supporting all of this being something that was an embarrassment to everybody. I don't know if it sounds familiar to anybody, but this is history of cities. It's always that. Well, San Sabino was presented with a puzzle. How can you keep the coffers filled with revenue and build this library? Well, he developed a scheme in which he found other sites less central than this for all of these uses. Purchased them and started developing the building. And they're on a land approach to Casa San Marco, just as important commercially, but less visible. And he started building the Great Library, but he started at this end. And it took 40 years to build the thing. And he built it day by day. So after 30 or 40 years, you can see the library is almost finished, but look which building remains, and who is still there, producing revenues for the city up to the very last moment, until it was all finished and they could be moved and relocated to another place. So the tales that we, that we have now, the things that we think about when we're worried about, can you really do this on the water? Can you really put something in the center of town like this? Can you really we develop that part of the town because we've got this party, this party, this party, this party, all with their interests not uh, that are against what we're doing. How do we do it? Well, history proves all you need is a great urban designer, you're all set, right? That was size of the earth. Well, we could go on with many water cities, but there are a couple other particular aspects that I'd like to emphasize about them. This little town 
Um, the French Riviera has a wonderful kind of quality of gentility to it as the buildings come to the bay off the, uh, off the sea. Um, Colofino, a very famous one on the Italian Riviera, is, I think, endlessly fascinating to us involved in urban design because of the way in which the water penetrates deep into the city. Um, and when you look at the plan of the town, you can see that it is the public plaza of the town, which is an ex extension of the shape of the water, much like some of the things you see in St. Petersburg. And all the streets of the town lead to it, and the hillsides are set up so that you look over those towns, over the roofs of what's below, uh, into the area. In San Juan, we find a very interesting waterfront, uh, uh, kind of a decorated waterfront, uh, which is connected to the streets of the city by virtue of these views and vistas that connect you from the, hill, the hillier parts of the old town uh, to, uh, to the waterfront past that park. And one of my favorite all-time photographs is this one, which is from saint paul de Vence, uh in the south of France, in which we have Simone Signore and Yves Montan sitting in their front door, looking through their axis all the way to the Mediterranean. In the background, even though it's four or five miles away, it shows the lengths to which we will connect ourselves in a dramatic way to something as magical and fantastic as a waterfront. And also on the country right here, a very interesting phenomenon that instead of the beaches off on the peninsula somewhere or in a different location, they're right in the middle of downtown with a kind of promenade that comes along. And some of them, East is one, Montana is another one, in which there's a kind of raised promenade because of the topography, buildings directly along the waterfront, the beach, and then the promenade above it giving you this extraordinary capacity to be at the beach while you're in the middle of downtown, which you are in this shop on the promenade that I'm playing um, at the east. So this connection between water and building, between water and daily life, between the structure of the city and water is something which I think can make absolutely fabulous and successful cities. Paris has many lessons, uh, some of which has to do with water, and I'm going to use just a couple shots of the, of the Seine and the way in which the streets and the buildings and the spaces of cars are created around it to make really just one very simple point about Paris. And that is Paris, I believe to be a model city because it is not only in places a water city, it is a residential city. As perhaps the highest concentration of people living in its center of any city in the Western world, 50,000 people per square mile, which is compared to something like 17,000 in Manhattan. Um, all in five to seven story buildings. All the buildings have a cross section in which the ground floor is commercial, and then offices, and then apartments above it. So no matter what the level of public use is, people are living everywhere. That means everywhere you go in the city, as you walk along the river, as you walk along the streets, there are eyes on the street, there are symbols of people living there in the forms of those windows, which are all identical, which tell you that it's a safe and secure place. Everything is a neighborhood I would proclaim, without a doubt, that the reason the restaurants are the best in the world in Paris is because of this quality that they're all in the neighborhood with the current population. You cannot sustain restaurants simply with a business district or an entertainment district or a festival area or whatever is a cultural district. You have to have a 24 hour, seven day week population. But if you don't believe me, try to get a decent meal in one of the single use districts like La Defense outside Paris. You just can't do it. It doesn't work, even in that culture. And so as we move about the city and marvel at the way in which the water is celebrated with the structures that get us across it, this is the Canal Saint Martin. Again, we are always blind with houses and occasionally greeted by major buildings like the new uh, Toll House building now in the museum, but always housing uh, and residential uses are part of that. So water is brought in, people live everywhere, it's an ideal kind of city. In this country, we have some models that are constantly uh, celebrated and call, for good reason, uh, call our attention to some of their qualities. Annapolis in Maryland, uh, in which the waterfront is tied to a brilliant plan uh, from before the revolution. Uh, in which uh, in which the waterfront on the snowy day is up at the top of the slide, and then a pattern of streets leading to the Capitol Circle and to the Church Oval uh, ties the fabric of the city to that waterfront in a very dynamic way. You can see this in the plan with the waterfront on the lower right. You can see the way the structure 
chemistries ties that together. So that there is, yes, an important space along the waterfront. There are shops along the waterfront, but it's not just that. That is tied organically, just as in Portofino, to all the streets of the city. Isn't it interesting that cities like Baltimore, which had industrial areas like Fells Point uh, and the Canton District, uh, now have those as the most important uh, residential, entertainment, mixed-use parts of the city that's attracting an extraordinary number of high-tech businesses into old block buildings in an environment that people would have thought had given up on many, many years ago. Part of it has to do with this fabric of traditional buildings that are attracting people. Part of it has to do with the mix of activities. A lot has to do with the present presence of this formerly industrial waterfront, now residential, entertainment, cultural, and recreational waterfront. And we see in cities, whether it's like Portland along its river, a new kind of housing initiative that's, that's uh, constantly being developed, in which we're finding something like four to six story residential buildings creating human scale environments, sometimes adjacent to parks, adjacent to waterfronts like this, that are bringing life back. Um, in our work, we come across many experts on this field, and one of the most respected ones, um, and then Mark Dominic said to me recently when we were in Norfolk, that in a downtown, if you can get up to a population of 5,000 people living downtown, you may. And when you cross the threshold of 5,000 people, his observation, suddenly a whole new range of uh, community activity begins to take place. It was really a concrete kind of detail that happens spontaneously. Instead of a long, hard struggle in a few old time years to get up to that point, it becomes enough critical mass of people to be able to do that. So if you want a downtown to thrive and flourish, you've got to bring a permanent residential population uh, to it. Uh, we find that this transformation of American waterfronts in our own work uh, leads to endlessly fascinating conundrums and interesting challenges. For example, we were involved as part of a team uh, to look at the Brooklyn Bridge Park. There are two bridges, the Hampton Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge Park here, um, in which a lot of this is being developed as park. Former uh, shipping port is now uh, being abandoned by the Port Authority and developed for recreation, commercial, and residential development. Um, downtown Brooklyn is way up here. So one of the at Brooklyn Heights, a very extremely fashionable address is here. So one of our key challenges uh, as urban designers was to find ways of connecting along North Fulton Street, for instance, here, uh, or other streets, connecting the dense fabric of the city to this new amenity of the waterfront. And we spent a great deal of time trying to find the right form for the design of streets, the location of new apartments. Uh, adjacent to the Brooklyn Bridge, opening up some of the closed, uh, later closed aspects of that bridge, bearing in mind always where we are, going towards the water, sad to say, no longer the Great Monument at the end of the Twin Towers, which when we did the study in the year 2000, uh, was still a visible landmark at that point. Pittsburgh, city in which we're located, where our practice is located, is an interesting portrait in the transformation of American waterfronts. Uh, this photograph taken before the, second, before the Second World War shows what the Golden Triangle, now called the Golden Triangle, was like. This is the Allegheny River, the Monongahela River. They formed uh, the Ohio River at this point, kind of gateway to the west. Uh, it was an industrial city, a waterfront, continuously industrial. Look, this is the Allegheny, which is the less industrial of the three rivers. Uh, as you're looking up past the towers of downtown. Rail lines, rail terminals, shipping facilities, barges. This is the industrial center of that region. Um, when group of people came back from World War II and found that the government breathed in Pittsburgh uh, and that the city could not compete uh, with uh, other cities in attracting new businesses and new industry, a uh, group of city leaders joined uh, with uh, the political leadership who joined with Richard King Mellon and the business interests, a remarkable uh, sort of uh, combination of, uh, of traditional war democratic politics and the King Club Republicanism uh, to join together to create a new vision for downtown Pittsburgh. Now, one of the key features in that, uh, in that transformation was the elimination of all the industrial uses along the waterfront of the Golden Triangle, and the railroad lines, and the 
bridges across the front and creating quite a state park as a major focus uh, of the region's activities. Uh, there are three rivers, as I said, Allegheny, the Montevideo, and the Ohio. There's a fourth river underground which feeds this fountain that comes up as a little piece of poetry. And this park was the centerpiece in rebuilding a significant part of downtown Pittsburgh. And that park is the place where great festivals take place, uh, where people gather uh, special events. That park, however, is not now, as we look at it, entirely successful. It is separated from downtown by all the criteria we just talked about. It is a public space that is separated from downtown, cut off by an expressway in spite of the fact that there's quite a beautiful under, underpass that you go through to get to downtown. It is not an integral part of the city. So during the week, it's a dead place. Um, and it certainly has not lived up to the potential of people expected as a revitalizing tool for downtown. So what to do? This place, this activity, this festival place is divorced and separated from the fabric of the city. How can it be connected? And there's a recent study that completed by Herman Chan Krieger of Boston for a private interest group called the River Life Task Force, headed by the business community led by the editor of the newspaper, John Cray, uh, in Pittsburgh, um, has looked at how Point State Park can be connected with continuous riverfront parks along the Golden Triangle and can be joined with other developments already underway uh, to create a continuous, almost Parisian like setting for tying the river to the activities of the city. Uh, we have been involved for a number of years with, for some reason, in several cities uh, with sports teams. You know, there's this great impulse to build new stadiums. You know, one of the things you need to be careful of are things like arenas and public auditoriums and convention centers and stadiums. But they have a very short shelf life. All the ones that were built 25 or 30 years are now being demolished and replaced with, with the latest model. So the question is, you put all your money into these big facilities as a city. How do you protect that investment with the knowledge that probably going to be obsolete? Well, the building is going to be obsolete. How do you protect your investment? How do you create a total environment? So our effort, and I'll show you three of them, has been to try to weave these ultimate big box things of the stadium uh, into a pattern of new development that connects with existing development so that they become elements within a city district on the waterfront. Not separating development from the waterfront, but connecting to the waterfront in a very real way. We began working actually for the two sports teams, then for the city, then for the Rural Task Force, and now again for the city to try to both locate these two buildings in a way in which they were less harmful to the urban environment, and then find ways developing the riverfront park and creating connections to the fabric of the city. And so in the sort of in the evolution of that, one of the first of these pieces we built was the fire skating, seen here from our office window, the 31st story drop tower. You're looking down for great It's one of the advantages of being involved in the planning. Uh, and you can see it's on the north side of the Allegheny River. We are on the Golden Triangle. On the south side, there are three, three bridges. I don't know if you see two of them. This one uh, is closed to traffic during game time uh, and filled as a pedestrian space connecting the two sides of the river. For many, many years, the river was a barrier between two cities. Now, with the scale of this activity and the scale of this development, the, city, the river is itself becoming a public space. Lexington is becoming a kind of main street for the city. Um, and as you go through it uh, and see the different activities, walking across that bridge, there's a sense not only of great festivity when traffic is closed, but a sense of the design of the stadium as to how a retail frontage is created as a facade for that stadium along Federal Street, so that there's a kind of seamless connection between the life of the city, with or without a sports event going on, uh, and the activity of the sports event. Um, and then, of course, when you're in the stadium itself, looking back to the city, here we are up here, right there at our, uh, our offices, as you're, as you're in the stadium, looking back to the city, you are connected to it. And there's a whole sport among voters now uh, to wait out in the water because it's a slightly short uh, field. And so once in a great while, there's a home run uh, that voters rush to catch in the city, all of which engages the city with this facility and with this place and with this wall. But here's 
here's a story I wanted to share with you that's not unlike the story of San Samino in San Marco, um, in that it had to do with Cincinnati's riverfront and the replacement of this stadium, which is called Synergy Field. It was called Synergy Field. It was a stadium that was used by both the Cincinnati Reds and the Bengals. It didn't work. It was 35 years old. It was time to tear it down. And the county and the city jointly passed a bond issue for $300 million. Now, this is a city, a region that couldn't pass a school bond issue or a library bond issue, but got $300 million for building two new stadiums. Um, now, Walter Kulash is a brilliant traffic planner that we try to work with on every project from Orlando, Florida, uh, said, well, now, this is a case where we need to ride on the coattails of the lust for big things. Right? You have this somehow this appetite for these big box things. How do you take that invest in a big thing and pyramid your dollar so that you get a lot more benefit for it than simply building that facility? How do you take that to make that work? Well, Roxanne Falls was then the mayor of uh, since a very strong and forceful uh, leader of that city. And she and the county commissioners of Hamilton County got together and asked us to do a planning study to develop not only the location of the two new stadiums, but also a plan for the riverfront that would serve city needs and reconnect the city to the river. And of course, both teams wanted their new stadium right here, in the same spot, directly in front of the historic Rolling Bridge. Right there. And blocking any chance of connecting the downtown to the waterfront. So we had a public process. Lots of media in which in the first stage, as with all of our work, we ask in small group sessions, large group sessions, what people like best about their city and this waterfront, what they like least about it, and what they most like to see. And from the responses to all of that, we derive a set of principles based on what people told us. One is that on this riverfront location, it was essential to reconnect the city to water. That was its history. It was essential to connect the waterfront park to the city. It was essential to overcome the barrier of the expressway. It was essential to create a grid of streets to develop developable land that extends the fabric of the city. It was essential to include transit. It was important to create parking, not only for these two new monster facilities, but for downtown, and important to preserve views of downtown. Those principles, the sort of guiding element in the planning process, led to this plan, which located the two stadiums at the edges where there was no chance of real connection and enabled us to build a new structure of streets that extend across the expressway to a riverfront park, to the bridge, but symbolically a museum celebrating the Underground Railroad in the center with mixed use buildings for apartments and offices around the perimeter. So that the district is extending the city to the waterfront. Now one of the key obstacles to this was a huge expressway. 450 feet wide with interchange ramps in the middle. How in the world do you ever that? Well, as luck would have it, expressways are not eternal either. They fall apart, have to be rebuilt. Thank God, you know, the soul works at the way. Hey, have hope. They, they will go away. And there was a program to rebuild it, which the city and the county intersected with this planning process and found a way of rebuilding the expressway in a way that could change it. So that not only is it a narrower trench, but it could be lit over as a key part of this plan. And here it is, under construction, in which the expressway is now this narrow chunk, and all of this is being developed as ground for new development. The two stadiums are now built, and development is now underway on the fabric that happens with it. So when you get everybody together, you can do this kind of thing. Here's another example I'm just going to flash through very quickly, because oh, I just want to make this point that as a result of that, when all of this is done, the stadium will no longer be just an isolated piece all by itself. It will be part of a neighborhood uh, in which new buildings with apartments uh, and uh, offices of various sorts, residential development, will make sure that this is a kind of in-town district. So you can sit there, have a cup of coffee, look out, get a peek of the stadium or the rooftop, view down to the river just out of sight there, uh, so you're reconnected to the water. This takes enormous energy to get all of the business community, the governmental entities together to do this. But once you have a vision of what it is, it's entirely possible to do. Here's Minneapolis. 
great falls that had occurred on the Mississippi River right near downtown Minneapolis with a series of historic mill buildings. Uh, this is part of a master plan which began with the idea of putting a stadium there. The stadium went away before it was ever built. It was defeated as an idea. But the plan, which developed a district uh, for it, uh, was implemented. Uh, and the plan called for a series of mixed use residential development uh, uh, buildings. This is going to take a minute to park. I guess it's a big image. I'm going to flip back here. Uh, mixed use residential development around the stadium site. When the stadium site went away, the Guthrie Theater said, hey, wait a minute, we'll come there into this new history. And then, uh, therefore, I developed this as a major part of the city. And I'm going to close with a brief look at Norfolk, Virginia, which I understand has, in many ways, some similarities to uh, Pensacola. It's a city that's very much dependent on the Navy. It's not dependent on the Navy, the Navy plays a very important role uh, in its uh, in development. I'm having trouble getting out of Minneapolis. It's cold up there. 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 Well, here's another one. I'm sorry, this is a medium industrial waterfront in uh, Lantana, where there's a boat yard, which is now being converted uh, into a development with a uh, mixture of uh, apartments, uh, shops, uh, and is a development that's going to create a new kind of center on the waterfront. Again, with a character that's trying to build on some of the South Florida uh, imagery uh, to create, if not a Portofino line, a Florida version of Portofino line uh, development on the waterfront. Um, and I might say, as a piece of credit to the market example, it is selling like hotcakes as a development, this attraction for uh, what the waterfront has for people um, is a kind of irresistible tool uh, for economic development. So therefore, we have come to the conclusion that cities with either views of mountains, trade parks, waterfronts, natural features of this sort, need to find ways in which their structure uh, and the experience of being in the city um, can connect all the spaces uh, to those beloved features. I think Norfolk as it was about 1975 <coughs> in its transition. Uh, it's still uh, a city on the water, but it was an industrial waterfront. There were great well, one time rail lines coming up to Peters at this point. This stage, the city was clearing that land and trying to create a new life for downtown. By 1980, the development in downtown Norfolk looked like this. All of this industrial land had been cleared, nothing on it. Um, much of the redevelopment had happened inland, away from the waterfront, prior to people realizing that the waterfront was going to be the hot property. Um, and only one building, a hotel, oddly enough behind Burns, almost a fortified development, had just barely reached out on the waterfront. So this is where it was in 1980. By 1989, when we came along, 1990, when the plan was published, those buildings in red had been accomplished in those intervening years, between 1980 and 1990. More development had come to the waterfront, particularly the waterside. This is Grandview Street. Grandview Street, the main shopping street, was not doing well. The waterfront was beginning to do well. Grandview Street was failing. In fact, the day we began our planning process, the Smith Welcome department store, the last of the seven department stores that had survived uh, on Grandview Street, closed its doors permanently. And our master planning challenge at this point in 1990 was to see if it was possible to revive Grandview Street and to create a commercial center on this cleared land called R8, romantically enough, 17 acres of land in the center of town. Now, as we look at this challenge for downtown, it's interesting to notice the Town Point Park had been built, roughly seven and a half acres of land with parkland. Very successful as a park, served as a major attraction, had a lot of parties there. It's a kind of urban revitalization through parties approach that succeeded in, in Norfolk. It got people back to downtown. They didn't go to downtown, they just recovered the party. And that fact was part of the problem inherent to Town Point Park and the waterfront. This road, which we designed as an expressway, got dropped to grade with expressway standards. And so the waterfront development was cut off from downtown. And all through the 13 years that we've been working on downtown Norfolk, a consistent effort has been to find ways of connecting downtown 
and efforts to revive downtown to the amenity and the vitality of the waterfront in Fall Branch. In addition to that, there's an historic district here, just barely 1990, holding together at the edge of this kind of wasteland, and then a major neighborhood called Ghent, which had been revitalized a little bit further away. So the 1990 plan that we developed tried to take these factors and develop a strategy for filling those gaps, for connecting up the fabric of the city and connecting the corridors that connect the waterfront into Randy Street, from the waterfront along the waterside area in Town Point Park into Main Street and to Grandy Street in this direction. Uh, in this plan, the priority projects were indicated in red. <coughs> less clear about the shopping center site because in the middle of our study, the ULI panel came along and said it's impossible to forget about it, so we developed it as some sort of fuzzy thing for the future. They said the main effort was to revive Randy Street as an urban village, get housing there, get some cultural uses, and connect it to the residential zones, create all places which the water plan tried to do. So that's the plan as drawn in 1990. Here in red are the successes of those 10 years. This is the amount of development and the location of development that is completed as of the year 2001. So you can see that process of filling in, make those connections to the water has been accomplished. Surprising to everyone, the city managed to get a major retail facility called the Carter Center, uh, not only attractive and located here, but thriving and extremely successful with its open retail facades facing Grandview Street, adding light to it. And in Keel was landing in Community College early on in the process to get it to come into downtown Norfolk. So we have a series of pieces that come together to strengthen downtown Norfolk. The, the Carver Center came because of the presence of the residential and the efforts to rebuild it and the community that like it to community colleges there. And they saw the advantage of how the resort market, particularly with some of the arenas here, could work for a retail center. In 1998, the year before this opened, total retail sales for the city of Norfolk were $50 million. 1999, the year it was open, $250 million. The year 2000, after a full year of operation and the impact on Randy Street was beginning to play $350,000. So imagine what that means in terms of sales revenue. And I attribute it to great leadership of the city, and I attribute to the fact that what we've been able to do is to connect the waterfront and the historic residential area of Norfolk to these amenities to create a whole place, which is a real urban environment in that area. So therefore, I'm a firm believer uh, in this kind of strategy work. And so we have. We have here something like 300 units of residential development now about to enter their last phase. All of these are completed. Um, the Battleship Wisconsin, not shown on this one, but shown on the previous one, we go back to that, uh, arrived uh, next to them, as you can see it, you can't miss it, the last of the great uh, battleships, uh, major attraction in the market. And the next view we have is going to be next to the battleship looking at this new residential development, which is out on the water. So much like some of the recent development which you're doing here on the waterfront, the effort has been to connect the city to the waterfront to endanger, to get people living everywhere, just like in Paris. So things like College Place, which go back to this department, last of the department store, which is now the community college, we were able to get through drawings like this, developers interested in developing them as mixed-use building, residential or retail, uh, to create a kind of urban environment breaks barrier streets like this, which is Bush Street, which is one of the streets along in those empty areas separated the Freemason area from Randy Street and downtown, have now through this development been transformed into a residential boulevard lined with houses. Uh, these are apartments actually, but with front streets for the downtown apartment to create a civilized and continuous environment. And now there's the next stretch of projects. That much has been accomplished. This is now the recently published plan for the year 2010 in which a series of targeted initiatives are working to extend the development, to further the connections to the waterfront, to add additional development in different places along the waterfront, to move the development northward so the whole of the downtown uh, is beginning to work together. And I wanted to close with this little, little exposition on waterfront. This is Waterside Rock. This is the Waterside. This is Town Point Park. This is a proposal for effectively linking Grandview Street as a pedestrian space, adding parking spaces on the uh, waterside drive to Tamman, 
um, and to make more effective linkage. Because you see now, uh, and, and this shows that in three dimensions, that there are a series of little, little city initiatives to begin to tie this together so that we overcome the barrier obstacle of this road and the fact that this park is so separated from downtown. Um, so these are things such as this. For instance, Granby Street now as it comes and approaches the water never gets there. It goes through a federal customs house parking lot with chain of fence around it. Just can't get there. In spite of that, and then you get here, you have to jump over a sewage thing and then up a mound and then cross in the middle of busy traffic all the way across. The amazing thing is people do it. I mean, it's like a sort of adventure course for people to be able to do it because the lifeline of getting from downtown to out of earth on the waterfront is so important. So the plan is a very simple one. Uh, hard to implement because it requires collaboration with the federal government. But to get uh, collaboration, to get a pedestrian walk across to that point in time, it's a little thing, it's a little piece of surgery, we call it urban active ones. We've got to find the right place to put something to make the connection. And then here, standing in our parking garage, looking at the so called, again, romantically called R2 for the development parcel, um, at the end of one of the connections to downtown, the sort of never finished piece of open space is now being looked at as some development to, uh, to better connect it into downtown. Uh, so the objective is always to find ways of creating homes. Uh, cities are about whole place. Urbanity is about having a place where you can walk uninterrupted through civilized, organized environment with people living, interacting with people. That's what it's all about. That is the great attractor, uh, we believe, uh, for a new business, for attracting people to make them want to live in your city for having them fall in love with your city. So that these kinds of small initiatives come together with big initiatives, uh, like the stadium and arena projects which we showed you in other cities, uh, to create a total environment. So that the assets that you have on the waterfront get time back to the fabric of the city to celebrate the fact that like Norfolk, uh, this is a waterfront city, and Norfolk, like Venice, will enjoy tremendous success as a water city. Thank you very much. Uh, and which 
major heavy manufacturing is really happening in other parts of the world. And our professor would feel this very strongly that to replace that economy with newer uh, economies. That the whole nature of the economic value of water plants for industrial development has changed. It's no longer the highest best use for a lot of these uh, materials. So in Martin's case, in Pittsburgh's case, it was easier because a lot of that just disappeared quite naturally, combined with a healthy kick in the rear end on the part of, uh, of the desire to get it going. Communities were a key part, key part of that. But again, it was a coalition. It was a part that takes more than just one and three. It was Richard King known and more, and we established the LEA Conference, which is Association of Business Leaders a powerful force uh, to drive that change. Uh, David Lawrence, then mayor of the city of Pittsburgh, who then became governor of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, head of the Democratic Party machine, joined forces with the Alabama Congress. So together, they got the funding to get it to the wall. So cleaned up the air, in the water uh, early compared to most other cities. Uh, when I say early, they made strides early. If you came back in the late 50s, it still smelled bad. But it was much better smelling than it had been 10 years. <laughs> 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 